there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, people talk about vegan investing, and I spent five years in that field. And there's a problem with vegan investing. It has to do with finance, the nature of finance itself. And what it's led to is an overemphasis on things like consumer packaged goods, which people like you and I know are terrible for the, our health, and they're also not good for the environment. I mean, at, at the very minimum, if you go on Instagram, you'll see all kinds of photos of people doing river cleanups, but there's just sort of endless supply of trash yeah. entering uh, nature. So do, so I, I get it, but I think this is one of the interesting challenges in the vegan movement is you've got some people who are just sort of, you know, one-pointed on saving farm animals, even at the expense of other animals in nature. Mm -hmm. And they're not really driving a health message. So, you know, I'm not really here to spend a lot of time criticizing those people, but let's just say that there's something about that business that is keeping us sick, you know, and it's not the business itself, it's it's the financial aspect of it. So that's something I'll explain. And the other thing is that uh, Dr. McDougall, you know, for years, he said, well, you know, we don't have any money, the industries have all the money, and I'm going to disprove that. And the thing is, our, the money for the things that you and I care about is just very poorly organized. So I've literally been, I was a political, I was an environmental political organizer in the 90s and very successful at changing a, a national forest policy mm. oh, wow. uh, that affected the entire national forest system and benefited that. And uh, people... I knew this would happen. Other people made a lot of money from the efforts to try to protect public lands. You know, this the, the long ever since the founding of this country, and of course before then, you know, the idea of public lands. But let's just take it uh, from the we'll say after the Jefferson expansion, the United States took possession of a lot of lands, and then. There's been a constant political battle about whose land is it really and who has the right to decide what can be done on this land that's sort of held in trust for the citizens of the United States. Yeah. So uh, we were of the opinion that uh, we should be protecting biodiversity. That should be the number one value. And we implemented policies like that. But the thing is, when we started this in 1990, I predicted that the result of that would be new economic development that was aligned with ecology. And that happened. Mm. And uh, people, it, like we, the result, at least for a period of time, was a, a multi billion dollar annual diversion away from paying money to cut trees down to paying money for things like restoration projects and other things. And again, that's very, we get very granular. I don't want to do that. All I'm saying is, is that as people awaken, there's new economies. So when we think about what Dr. McDougall was saying, I, I really love what he says. I mean, I, like you, kind of came into veganism largely thanks to Harley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Marine Rider. Yeah. Because I was really in, in pretty bad shape and tired, and I'd wake up in the morning with, like, no energy and start watching YouTube, and he had it in my feet. It's like, and I was, I didn't even really know what veganism exactly was as a diet. I just knew it. From the 90s is kind of like the people who are against animal testing which i am but i i really didn't know the depth of the issues and harley just had this comprehensive education i've watched almost every video he's ever made yeah, yeah. um these days i'm a little less frequent because you know i know the rep but still you know he's still very inspiring and what he's saying is right on and and so lately i've been watching a lot of mcdougall videos again um and, and what he's saying is also very powerful. So what am I really talking about here? So I'm going to show you, I'm just going to show you a, a, my first image. Then I'll share my screen. I just want to show you something. Okay, so I uh, wrote a, with the help of an assistant, about a 120-page book over the last several years. It's not in print yet. It needs a lot of work. But yeah, we really analyzed everybody that's making money off of killing animals and animal foods themselves are about two trillion dollars annual sales, and food services about two and a half trillion. And then there's these other related industries that are harmful to animals. But the biggest piece of the puzzle is chronic illness. So this is globally, but in the U.S., chronic illness, and even McDougall is saying this, is about four point five trillion. So the U.S. has got the lion's share 
Yeah, um, yeah. This, but, what, it's but, nuts. but what this means is that there's an economic opportunity. And this, unfortunately, Dr. Redoodle, and he's doing incredible work, but now we're in the stage where we'd want to replicate that. And I have met, like I, uh, Dr. Esselstein invited me to one of his talks, and there I met doctors, and also when I used to live in Ohio, other doctors came to me, and they say that they want to, um, they want to um, have a plant-based practice. They were sick of their practice. I remember this one woman, she said, well, every day I go in, I'm seeing these kids there. They've got diabetes. They're like, you know, 10, 8, 10. That's crazy. And the thing is that because she was part of a corporate health practice, she said, I get 10 minutes with the patient. It's not like I'm going to go in and really give them lifestyle counseling. And that's why she said, I want to get out of there. But these guys, you know, they they had their big house and they had their payments and even their parents were visiting. Them. You know, they were living in a nice very nice American lifestyle. I was at their house because they were close to these sort of vegan get-togethers, but didn't know anything about how to start business. They didn't know how to economically make a transition from being in a corporate practice to running their own shop. And, and the thing is, the work of Dr. Google um, and Dr. Bernard and so many of these other doctors have been out there talking. They have conferences, and there's a lot of doctors who have conventions who would like to be in this field, but they have no idea how they're going to survive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, Dr. McDougal and these guys, they've made a nice financial ecosystem around themselves with books. Dr. McDougal had, I don't know, I, I think they're probably still, you can still buy them, you know, McDougal's packaged food stuff. You can get them at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Dr. Bernard now, knows he has a, a, a clinic and they, he's been really good at raising money from non, you know, from much uh, foundations and things like that. So these are geniuses on more than one level. You know, Dr. McDougall is not just a genius medically, but also in terms of how to, how to be able to, to be able to afford to do his work. Mm -hmm. And now starting a practice from scratch, you know, where you get your clients, there's a, it's a marketing project, it's a business project. And I, I mentored some of these uh, vegan doctors and they knew absolutely nothing about business. And of course, so they were terrified. At the same time, they were terrified to hire me to build their practice around them. So what's the real opportunity? I, I'm gonna share my screen again. So, Dr. McDougall says there's not enough money. Actually, is wrong, and I don't mean this in a bad way. But he just doesn't actually understand what's going on. So here is, an, and I've been tracking these kinds of numbers since 2001. No, oh, wow, for a while. So I, I only went vegan in 2016. Yeah. Uh, after I heard about Arlie and, and watched his videos and then finally freely had a video of what happens with the baby chicks and I thought, just thought, Jesus Christ, I've been in, how could I be involved in this thing? So that September 1st, 2016 is when I vowed to uh, get out of that. You know, I'd stopped eating meat in 2014 for other reasons, more spiritually. Mm, yeah. And then, I, then but when I finally cut out all the things in dairy, that's when suddenly my energy and my health just started popping back. Just like Harley said. But anyway, so, but in 2001, so I spent the nice, you know, I built an environmental organization in Washington from scratch. We were four blocks from the U.S. Capitol building. And, you know, we did our best to make policy and we were pretty effective as we, and and because the, the major environmental groups weren't really doing anything. And we, we literally changed the way a lot of the major environmental groups did business because they couldn't denied that we were running circles on them. Our budget was like a hundredth of the Sierra Club, but we were getting votes on the floor of the house and senators, and they were just sitting on their hands, basically. But anyway, so then when I when that worked, I thought, what's going to be the next act? Next act? So in, 20, in 2001, I set up to create an ecological investment fund. I knew nothing about finance at all, really. And, you know, I knew a little bit about stocks, the stock market, but most people never think, well, where do those stocks come from? Like people say in the vegan, where does your, 
where's the milk come from, right? People don't know that. Most people have no idea how investment products are created. And just like the creation of dairy products is very detrimental to the environment and to the animals, the style in which we create investment products has a lot to do with what kind of economy we are building. So here is a snapshot of the market investors, people who invest in, in things. And I'm just focusing in on the stock markets, public stock markets. There's crypto, there's uh, real estate, which is about you know vast. So there's there's hundreds of trillions of dollars of investment capital. But I'm just focusing on this one because it's a nice round number. And if we look at this group, it's called Healthy and Green Lifestyle Investors. This is this has been a demographic that's been tracked since the 90s and the beginning of Whole Foods, I think, in, in the 80s. These are the people that ate healthier, bought Toyota Priuses back when people thought that was better for the environment and things like that. Yeah. So they were people who had preferential uh, purchases oriented around their personal health and the environment. So that's 30% of pretty much the global market, of, at least of the people who are not in abject poverty. Because if you look at the whole global economy, except for the people who are in poverty just trying to get food for the next day, most of our decisions are value-based, like what color clothes we're going to wear or what style of architecture. So the economy is very can be changed very quickly if people adapt adopt a value set. And this is why we can actually protect the environment. We can protect the animals and even human health. It's really a communication problem. So this is what I'm saying. Here's $30 trillion of investment capital just sitting there for us to tip into to finance any kind of thing where we can get some traction. You know, we don't, we're not looking for charity here. We want to build businesses. Yeah. yeah. The, the market for charitable money is just a fragment of this, about maybe a trillion. And then these people don't care. So that's all right. And now if we go in and zoom in on this little wedge here, this is the vegan. So there's about 4 million vegan investors in the world. Basically, the numbers from my research that I've, you know, I've had these numbers in my head for 20 years, 20, 23 years now. So this three trillion is basically divided in thirds. That's why I made this chart this way. It's been a long time since I showed this. So this three trillion dollars is divided in thirds. The top one percent control a trillion. The next nine percent control another trillion, really. And then the bottom, these are people who have under a million dollars in their stock portfolios. They control another, another trillion. What I'm saying is there's no shortage of money. And what does it really cost to open a medical practice? Let's say we wanted to, to fund. That's a business that could be started for a, probably a million dollars. So just we could get 100 McDougal-style medical clinics in the major metropolitan areas of the United States for $100 million, basically, which is the nothing. It's a, it's a real drop in the bucket of this. Yeah, niche. for a trillion dollars, yeah. But the thing is, if we look back at like these if we look at let's look at what whole foods did i used to live in st louis i was born there and um i moved away for a while when i visited my mom one day there was a whole foods there and the thing was whole foods was draining the grocery store economy and st louis is kind of famous for some pretty big homegrown chains but the top one or two percent of the consumers were leaving those big chains. And you know the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule was it Pareto's law. Mm. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. So what that means is that one plant-based clinic would siphon off the top one to ten percent of medical customers for the whole medical industry in any metropolitan area. That's what I'm saying. That would be devastating to. I don't think the well, medical industry would like that. Well, they didn't like Whole Foods either. But finally, after a while, when they saw that the organic, because people, I remember when organic food was coming in, and now organic was solving a very important problem because before World War II, pretty much all food was organic. Yeah. yeah. But during World War II, the, the, the building of all of these nitrogen based munitions, you know, bombs, um, 
after World War II, there was a lot of nitrogen plants, and they thought, well, what are we going to do with all this nitrogen? Hey, I got an idea. Let's convince people that we yep. need to spray this stuff on our plants. Yep. And this has been an ecological and health disaster. Of course, <laughs> one thing yep. even, it, it, it's it's getting out there, but of course, you know, most of what people call agriculture is just growing GMO soybeans and corn and, and uh, other junk for cows and pigs and chickens to eat. Yeah. Yeah, it's really. I don't think most, really, most people know what the reality of this situation. No, you can't really call that farming. And so you know, because I've been, I I listen to a lot of different things, and people are sort of be you know, there's small family small family farms in the United States. The number of them is crashing. But what are we really talking about here? We we're making probably I don't I don't know the exact ratios, but we're probably growing ten times more food than we need because it's being processed through the intestines of, uh, you know, cows and pigs and chickens. So, and yet the food that we are getting directly is just, you know, such an incredibly low quality and polluted with gly glyphosate. Uh, I was watching the doctor you had on with Victoria just now before I got on this call. And he's talking about even the impact of glyphosate on our metabolism and, and how it kind of pairs with the, the standard American diet to just wreak havoc. Anyway, so what I'm saying is we can, there's ways now in 2016, the U.S. financial laws changed, but what's the real problem? So I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to talk about the problem I'm going to talk about and then the solution, but we'll go to the solution first. Right now, with a relative handful of people, we can begin to start financing. You know, there's plenty of doctors out there that would love to go into practice if we can pay them and manage their facility for them. So we could, and Dr. McDougall has all the data and information. It could be organized in a little more advanced and sophisticated way, but I can't tell you many times I've just gone, hey, I've got some kind of problem, and I just go and I type in Google, I go, Dr. John McDougall, and whatever the name of that problem is, and he's got his solution, he's got the data. And one thing he even said himself is now even Dr. Mercola, who's made a big business in just you know talking about whatever, even he's come around and agree with Dr. McDougal, which is like, yeah. that's a huge victory. Yeah. Cause I, I see Dr. McCall like one of the, you know, nemesis and you kind of see this, there's like this sort of firewall between what McDougal and Dr. Bernard are saying and then all these keto people, Joe Rogan, like when was the last time Joe Rogan had a guy like Dr. McDougal on? McDougal's like a national hero. And yet somehow there's like this wall or, you know, Elon Musk, he wrote a tweet saying, Ozempic for the win. I mean, yeah. How is it that he that that what Dr. McDougal is saying has, has not? So when you think that Elon Musk can't like, okay, give me the give me all, all the research on diet. I want to I want a comparison. How could he have been, How could he miss this? And, and yet, I, you know, I missed it. You know, McDougal's been doing this for fifty years. I only found out about it seven years ago, and that's so I. At the beginning of the in 2001, I set out to create this ecological investment fund. It was really hard. It was too hard. I raised capital, but it's a kind of business. It's a very difficult business to run. So I gave up in 2010 and I did some consulting work and web development. Mm. But then I went vegan and then the laws changed in 2016 that allow us to organize financially. Like it's legal to organize politically. And, you know, that's always been there. It's also very easy to raise money for charities. But in the 1930s, the U.S. government created a bunch of laws, basically creating a, a, a firewall between wealthy people and capital. And this is one reason why our economy is so lopsided. So many mm -hmm. big companies, many of them were founded before these laws. And then Silicon Valley was its own phenomenon. So we also been very tech heavy. But if you're just trying to start a business and solve some problem and you're not in Silicon Valley and you're not doing that kind of tech, you know, or biotech or all these really, you know, just tech oriented things. It's really hellish to start a business like that. Yeah. So I've been working on this problem for now 23 years. So in 20, I went vegan, my health bounced back, my intellect bounced back. It was in fact better than it ever was. And I, and then I saw these new laws had come into play and I'd never thought that would happen. I'd never thought we would have our rights. Like, we live in a so-called capitalist country, but for the most part, 
people are not allowed to participate in capitalism, which of course is why people hate capitalism because they see it as an elitist thing. Well, that came from laws from the 1930s and 40s that restricted the use of capitalism, the free speech in the area of uh, yeah. finance was taken away. There's things, if you say certain things the wrong way, you will you'll at least get to into civil court. I know. It's crazy. And how can that be? Why, why should the government be controlling what we say about money? Well, because they want to control, you know, so that was the first. I think you would have to look at 1913 uh, to figure that one out. When they well, we could go into a lot. You know, I have a friend who keeps me up to date on every kind of you know deep theory. But all I'm saying is, is that some other people who were very powerful and astute started working on reforming the laws and bringing back a measure of freedom. So now we actually do have free speech, especially to raise amounts. It's so easy legally now. Like when I first started on this, you needed to raise, you need to have fifty thousand in legal fees just to raise $50,000 because it was illegal and navigating the laws was almost impossible. Now those laws have really been broken down. You can, oh, sorry. I, I, I live in a place where they shoot fireworks for when there's having festivals. Oh. <laughs> um, everything's fine. No worries. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so now we have the opportunity to organize a very grassroots way that includes all potential investors where after the 30s, only the millionaires and above could actually even invest in companies. And then you got people saying, well, the, get a small business loan. That's the worst advice you can possibly do to start a business because first of all, you have to have a house that's paid off more or less to back the loan. Well, what if your business goes bust? You can't pay back the loan. Now you lose your house. It's, you know, we're in this terrible, and that, you know, the U.S. is partly where it is because we have this terrible financial climate, regulatory climate that prevents innovation in any place other than Silicon Valley where there's super high concentration of wealth. But you get out of there, it's, it's pretty tough. It's pretty ridiculous. But now, like I said, now that's changed, but very few people know about that. So this brings me back to the vegan finance world. So... In 2018, I started a company called Vegan Launch, and my idea was to do this kind of organizing, but not for ecology per se, but for vegan entrepreneurs, because I figured who would be more ecological than vegan entrepreneurs, and I felt a real affinity, and there's there's several thousand of them seeking capital and not succeeding, and I thought, well, I'll just help all of these people. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that was also hard to do, and we'll get into just touching on, let's say the biggest challenge most of these companies have is they, when they're starting up, they don't even, they don't even keep books. Mm. Like they don't have financial reports or anything. Yeah. So they're not really, so I'm on to a new iteration with a, a business partner where we're going to subsidize bookkeeping and marketing for companies in, in the vegan economy and uh, you know, environmental and ecological sustainability and livable cities and things that I like, a more broad spectrum, because it was really difficult. I, even if I gave free mentoring, I really couldn't get the uh, enough projects prepared for financing. So we're really changing the, I've really changed the whole business model. But when we go to something like an opportunity, people like Dr. McDougall, Dr. Bernard, the opportunity to replicate what these guys are doing, they've been training MDs for almost a decade now on yeah. what to do, but they don't have the business platform underneath it. And so now let's talk about just for a moment. So vegan finance has been largely following these old laws. Just people who are already wealthy, they said, hey, I'm going to do something nice. And some of the most famous vegan investors, they don't make any money as investors. They They've got other jobs in real estate or tech. They're just kind of retirees dabbling around. I've never been a dabbler. I've always been like a professional environment, you know, a professional in the environmental economy. I started my yeah. first environmental business in 1983, you know, the thing in Washington in the 90s. So I always, it would, I don't know if I can say this is vegan, but you know, I was one of those guys, I, I ate what I killed, right? I, yes, so yeah. I never, yeah. so, very few people are making money in vegan investing, but you do have these sort of 
elite vegan fund. There's somebody, you know, they were, oh, the vegan mafia. And people love to chat about, oh, the vegan investors. It's like, well, there's 4 million vegan investors out there. Where, where are they? They're, no one's really marketing investment products to this $3 trillion, 4 million person vegan investor market. There's just, a, a, like, we're talking about a, a handful, probably under 1,000 people participating in what's called vegan investing. So now what's the real problem here? Well, let's say that they fund a, a consumer packaged goods product company like uh, Field, maybe you remember Field Row Sausages? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, you know, I, I tried to, you know, I, those, things, I always, those things always gave me indigestion, but theoretically it seemed like the aesthetic, you know, spaghetti with some slices of, the, you know, it looked like yeah. a meatball. They really didn't digest for me personally. You know, no. I, I've had, I spent the last seven years healing my digestive problems from living in the Western economy for so long. So, for, you know, I'm, I maybe was overly sensitive. But the real problem is that in finance, when you think of the public stock market, it's what's called liquid. So for any given stock on any day, you can hold it. And if you want to sell it, there's someone with cash who's going to buy it. But the venture capital fund and the private investing model that all grew out of the 30s, they're not liquid. There's no readily, there's no easy way for people to invest in these things to exit and exchange their shares of stock for cash. Yeah. So what happens? You 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 know, they maybe some group of venture capital funds puts $50 million into a, into a vegan consumer packaged goods business or 10 million or whatever. How are they going to get their money out? And one of the, and, and what most people don't know is only one in 10,000 companies in the whole world trades on any public exchange at all. Hmm. So 9,999 out of the 10,000 companies are never going to have this kind of liquidity event where those early investors can once they've had their gains and the company's grown and it's more valuable, they have no way to get their money out. So that's loss unless yeah. they can sell. So what you have is most of the vegan companies, plant-based companies, and usually started by vegans, there's no one to buy the asset on the public market. It's very difficult to go public. Only like Oatly and Beyond Meat have even made it. And there's a couple other really... I don't even know. I can't even remember the names. There's really nothing for the vegan investor market on Wall Street. And of course, Oatly and and Beyond Meat have performed terribly because they were what's called pump and dump. So the private investors, they try to puff it up, you know, get Oprah to, to endorse yeah. it. And yeah. people think, well, if Oprah thinks it's good, and then these things just go down, you know, like a yeah. lead balloon. So this is a terrible, this is a terrible style of investing if we want to really change the world. And make it a better place, and and then, but here's the here is the um, the icing on the cake, which is negative icing or icing on the mud pie. <laughs> who who wants to buy these consumer packaged goods companies? Well, Group Denon, Unilever, General Foods, and like if you go up and down the aisles of Whole Foods and you look at the organic consumer packaged goods products, like Kind Bars. Or Laura Bar, I think Laura Bars or whatever, you know, those all those brands that were so, you know, cool in the nineties and the early two thousands, they all got bought up by big conglomerates. Now, what do these conglomerates do? Well, the meat industry alone, the guy this guy Paul Shapiro documented in one of his books, this is now almost 10 year old information. Just in the US, they're spending a hundred million a year for lobbying. Why? Because the global subsidies to animal industries is over half a trillion dollars a year. Like you could say one of the main businesses of these conglomerates is just getting money out of the government. And where does that money come from? People like you and me. So here, you know, people used to say, well, I don't want to go to McDonald's if even if they have a vegan burger, which is, you know, that's a that's cute. But what's really more serious is like some of the brands that we know are now owned by companies that are actively aggressively lobbying against the vegan value set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, so, and, and this is being, I don't know whether, they, you know, I've talked enough, this is a kind of conversation that the elite, the, the people in the elite circles of the vegan 
investing movement don't want to talk about because they want to get their exit too. And they want to say, yeah, I made $20 million when my, you know, meat-based butcher exited. But who did they exit to? You know, Unilever. What's Unilever doing with... And and, and, and so the thing is with the field roast sausage, this is a classic. It's not just the lobbying that these companies do, but field roast was bought up by a group called Maple Leaf Foods, which is the biggest slaughterhouse in Canada. Yeah. And then I think it was last year, you know, I've whined about this stuff, but nobody really cares, uh, you know. That's the problem. That's the problem, yeah. But anyway, so the CEO one day comes out and he's got this thing, he goes, well, the you know, the plant-based protein just isn't doing what everyone thought it would do. It's like, right, you asshole. It's because you're spending your entire marketing budget promoting animal products, lobbying against, lobbying for subsidies for your industry. And, and this is just a showpiece, maybe for you to get some, you know, brownie points with the ESG people. So it's not serious. And the thing is, so these companies, these plant-based companies are worth much more to these conglomerates just for optics. They have no interest in driving the growth of these companies. It's just, they're going to pay a hundred million, maybe a couple hundred million for a company. They're going to get that little market share. Oh, those cute vegans and their Birkenstocks, you know, let's, let's make a few bucks because that's how these guys do. They, they niche the market down and whatever the market wants, that's what they do, but they're not going to drive adoption like the founders of these companies did. And so when the guy comes out and says, well, yeah, you know, that, that purchase didn't work out as well as we thought. The demand just isn't there. It's like, that's such a disingenuous thing. So that's what's going on when we focus on consumer packaged goods in the, in terms of the financialization of them and their growth. The, the end game is that they just became become a revenue stream for people who are working against us. And there's just, and, and the thing is, people like you and me, it's like, rather than, again, rather than complain about the people doing it, because they're just such easy targets for me to whine about. Yeah. My work now is I'm focused on on leadership. That's my website. This is my name now, markwinstein.com. And I'm just calling myself a, a mentor for leaders. And that's what I really love doing. And the things I would love to be doing would be helping finance plant-based clinics, helping finance one-off vegan, you know, healthy vegan restaurants, mm. almost any kind of vegan restaurants better than what we've got. But yeah. you know, like, we're not really bringing, because the, the vegan finance world hates restaurants because they don't have the right kind of uh, growth dynamics. They're high on capital, high on risk and low on revenue. And they're trying to get the opposite. Yeah. So, Imagine, I mean, all over the world, I've seen homegrown vegan restaurants, Thailand. Uh, I'm in Mexico at the moment here. You know, there's there's Mexican vegans. In fact, there's over 100 vegan restaurants in Mexico City alone. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So this this is happening. And that's like 21 million people live there, right? It's, it's a pretty yeah, it's large huge. population. Yeah. It's one of the biggest cities in the world, if not the biggest. And, and, um, it's, I don't live there, but I've visited. It's cool. It's one of the coolest cities I've ever been to. It's also, it's just a huge city. And uh, I'm more, I, I like smaller towns. So oh. after a couple of days, like, oh, this is cool. I ate some great vegan food, met some nice people. And then it's like, I'm out of here. I got to get back to my little town where I can walk yeah. from one end of my town to the other in a half hour. Like I do my entire life grocery shopping, everything on foot. Oh, that's not nice. uh, yeah. So, so that's, so this is really, you know, it's not so much that I want to critique people. They did the best they could. And I think that they really did sort of open up a set of conversations, but there's really no leadership financially in the health, the, the just basically education and delivery of medical services. And yet, uh, it's a huge industry. It's, you know, U.S. 4.5 trillion annual revenue. Like, getting even a micro corner of that would make somebody very successful. And 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 so over the past several years, I've invented new ways to finance things that don't require 
a company go public or doing any kind of really esoteric things to provide a profit and liquidity to the investor. Like if you're going to raise capital, an investor wants to know, well, how am I ever going to make any money? Like, do you want me to just donate and give it to you? Or do you want to actually call this an investment? And as we've seen, if we, if we just focus on donations, then we're down to the really small part of the money world, just a trillion dollars, where if we focus on, if we can model our visions as a business and make them work financially, even a little bit, then there's a lot of opportunities. And then, you know, another thing too, on inter internally, so I'm saying my interest right now is to, it would be great to make some agreements, especially with a guy like Dr. McDougal, because I think he's got, he just, you know, he's so relatable. Yeah. And he also, I think is the person who would appreciate the most realizing that we're not the underdogs. We have trillions as vegans. We don't have to, play this game of sort of, uh, you know, cowering against the might of the pharmaceutical and medical industrial complex. Like we can go in and carve out our own market niche and just serve the people who, you know, imagine like, like I used to live in Columbus, Ohio. I think, um, you know, there's 12 million people in Ohio. Columbus is the center. So you got 12 million people within like a two or three hour drive. Yeah. When, so that means one well-marketed plant-based lifestyle medicine or it's like i like what dr mcdougall was saying diet therapy center in columbus reaches 12 million people now just the marketing alone imagine billboard saying did you know you can reverse type 2 diabetes in a week with diet now yeah. and dr mcdougall's not taking out billboards so we could afford to do like sophisticated marketing so what you're doing now you're mass educating with one little center that costs a million dollars to start up maybe a little more for marketing. And I've got the marketing people ready to go now as well. So we've got bookkeeping, we've got marketing, capital, I know where to get it. You know, really it's it's unlimited, but we it's really, we want to bring the leadership together. That's what's needed is people who are going to carry, uh, hold the responsibility. And we've got all the doctors we need as well. Yeah. So imagine this one clinic, they're mass educating 12 million people in Ohio every day. Out of that, some you know little fragment is going to go. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get healthy. I'm gonna do it. Right? We see if once I actually found out how to get healthy, I did it. Not everyone's going to do it. Some people say, you know, just give me the pills. Yeah. But well, I mean, then there's the uh, infrastructure for that as well, and there's plenty of well, again, but a, a doctor's office is. I mean, there's a lot of vacant office space in the United States right now. Yeah. So that's going for pennies. So yeah, plant based diet therapy centers and i think pairing those with sort of lifestyle restaurants maybe even cooking education centers mm. or, or i would think you would have to start that before you started a restaurant because if you start yeah, the clinic but, well, i mean because if you really think about it people are still under the impression that you got to watch the news or you got to go to your doctor to get the answers so if you found uh, you know, like a plant-based doctor and they were reversing type two diabetes and then they had a, a, like a center to go to. And then that center referred you to different restaurants in town that were plant-based. I think it would work better that way than. Yeah. Well, whatever. I would agree with that. I agree with that. That's why I really, like I really started making lunch in order to do this, but I had to go through a lot of, you know, I mentored so many different people and saw so many different ways that businesses and investments could fail. Mm, yeah. And, uh, but that, that's how I learned. And that's why what I'm proposing now is, it, you know, the, it's, it's worth trying. The risk is really low for the investors. It's even really low for the founders because the marketing, there's so many ways to test a business like this. So what's the cost of operating a business? You need an office that's rent. Again, that's super cheap right now. The biggest cost is going to be a doctor's salary and maybe, uh, you know, staff, at least one person just to get the thing booted up. So that's two people, basically. And we've got the accounting and the marketing sort of handled. And so that'd be built in the budget. So we're really looking at, and Dr. McDougall and these other guys, they've got all the research papers. So maybe that's another, and then who knows with AI, we could probably just like scan in everything and get it organized in five minutes into a really nice searchable database. You know, all of these, whatever these people have been saying, I don't even know if you need that. 
But in terms of having the doctors themselves being able to access the studies and, and be able to quote the way McDougal does, that would be a nice feature. I don't know if it's necessary because this stuff is so, it works so obviously. Like I said, for me, the very first week I followed Harley's criteria, my whole life changed. It didn't, yeah. and, and it wasn't Quick. like, yeah, and, it, and it's never been, it's never stopped. Just keep it getting better and better. So um, those are kind of my big ideas. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm really, what turns me on to no end is, is mentoring leaders. So like if somebody who's reading, watching this video or hearing this on a podcast, if they just want to lead this project, like if they want to take responsibility for, you know, transforming the seven and a half trillion dollar market of chronic illness, I'll mention them. And, and the first thing that we teach people is how to make money just for your commitment, because that's the hard part. The hardest part I've ever done in starting business is how do you survive yeah. during a ramp up? And I solved that problem. So now people are using my methodology. Like before they ever quit their day job, there's a methodology for building enough financial support that you can quit your day job before you even have a company built. Because people are, you know, I've done this in my life so many times. People are willing to pay for a commitment if you. What is a commitment? A commitment is like a, it's an aspect of being a human being. Human beings have, you know, we can be angry, we can be happy, we can we can be committed. You know, you're a very committed person. I mean, you understand what that means to live from your commitment as opposed to just whatever way the wind is blowing. Yeah. Money loves that. Money really follows that. And you can use that understanding to receive enough money every month to pay your bills while then you go and do the the leg work and the grunt work to boot up any kind of company, especially a company like this with a, you know, strong set of ideals, strong value proposition, more than just making money. You know, there's how many, how many, how many people would really love to see a, a McDougal style, you know, diet therapy clinic in every major metropolitan area of the world. I mean, there's probably millions of people that would go for that. I mean, even if it's 1% of the country. They're still yeah, looking and, at like 30, 30, what, 31 million people. Right. Or so 3 raising, million people. Yeah. So getting people just to support the vision enough that then you can go and raise the capital. And all these steps are mapped out. I'm starting to put courses online because I'm only doing personal mentoring with a few people who are, they're very committed people. And they do my homework. Like if you don't do my homework, then I get, I lose interest. Yeah. If you do work, you succeed. That's pretty much how it works. So I have a free course. Uh, well, you can watch it free on YouTube, or if you want my mentoring, it's uh, 2995. It's called how to achieve impossible goals. So this kind of gets you going into the idea of doing things you don't believe you can do. And I'm, I'm coming out with another, another seven courses on all the different kind of modular aspects of taking your big idea from just an idea in your head into actual reality hmm. and making a living it making a good living doing that because these are big problems with huge markets I mean, yeah yeah oh and I'm gonna tell, can i can i tell you one more thing another yeah, just a whole different so i showed you on that chart how two and a half trillion dollars a year goes just to food service commercial food service and so that's a huge niche and you don't need to do anything hardly to solve the problem there. You don't need to come up with plant-based burgers or anything like that. So here's how I know this. There's a group, a nonprofit in California called Greener by Design. Yeah. And they started doing some research projects. They started testing some theories because if you go, they tested two different things. One was, um, hospitals and so what you know hospitals when you're sick and then they come out and they, and they bring you a little menu mm -hmm. about what you could order and the same thing is if you ever go to you know what they used to call the rubber chicken dinners you know where you, everyone's sitting at these round tables yeah. in a big hall yeah and in order for them to make sure they got enough food they 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 ask you to order your meal in advance normally at the top of the menu in both of these things is the default is going to be some kind of beef dish. Mm -hmm. And so people would, people would, you know, 
they're lazy, they're whatever. They just like, all right, whatever. They want to fit in and they just order what's at the top. And these guys did some experiments to say, well, what if we just, and then the, you know, the plant-based meal would be at the bottom. They said, what happens if we just put the plant-based meal at the top? Yeah. They have the meat option at the bottom. What they discovered was a 50% reduction in consumption of animal products. Oh, wow. That's a huge. Right, right. And so now we're talking about 50% reduction in animal products available across a two and a half trillion dollar industry. And of course, you know, handling animal products is very costly because they're such disease vectors. You've got to have yeah. special cleaning techniques and yep. the whole thing, right? I mean, it's yeah, really special disaster. cutting boards, everything. Yeah. Right. So, so these, so there's a, the big providers of, uh, and of, uh, you know, food service meals, they could be saving billions and billions of dollars by doing basically nothing other than changing their menu. And now it's a little more than that, but so what I'm talking about is basically kind of consulting projects. And, and imagine somebody wants to sort of help veganize their city. You've got the school systems. You know, you've got people like Dr. Um, Barnard doing lawsuits, which of course, when you do lawsuits and you get, well, as soon as you get the government on board, there's pushback. Yeah. And people are saying, well, they're trying to take away our meat. Which, you know, linguistically, yeah. that's correct. They don't say, they're trying to save my life. Stop <laughs> doing that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, yeah. but anyway, so the thing is, instead of having this kind of transformation being forced on by lawsuits and laws, which freak everybody out, and rightly so, because most people have no, you know, I've made law, so I know what it's like, but how many people... There, if there's one in a thousand that's an entrepreneur, probably one in a hundred thousand have done what I've done in terms of actually creating federal policy, yeah. federal environmental policy yeah. uh, from scratch, not knowing anything, not knowing anybody when I've got to DC. Anyway, imagine one person in a city, if they could just have their bills paid for their, you know, food and shelter, like their lifestyle, they get yeah. those bills paid. Now they have the time to go talk to the school district. Say, look, I'm not in favor of laws telling what to do, but all, you can serve people the same way, but you'll save so much money. Here's the evidence. The chair, this charity, what they've done is public domain research now. But we could be creating these kind of uh, sort of like ad hoc consulting companies because there's more steps, not just change the menu. You need to get people on board, get the staff to learn how to make the dishes. We're not talking about, this is not like tech. This is not like a, you know, impossible burger. Yeah. We're just talking about changing what they buy from the food wholesaler and getting some better recipes and saving zillions of dollars that way just by putting the default option as an optional option and putting plant-based as the default option. So there's no restriction. There's no laws. So anyway, anybody who's listening to this who wants to lead on anything i'm not worried that i'm going to get you know nutcases if you're you know if you're trying to start a militia that's yeah, i'm not into that yeah yeah i've had to reject business from people like that in the past when i was doing my consulting work and said yeah i'm not going to help you make a website that markets you know semi-automatic rifles that's just i like the money but yeah i just don't feel like if you like being in that business i'm a i'm a peace-oriented guy yeah but so you know if you're Somebody who's interested in ecology, in the plant-based economy, in in having cities where you can, you know, where life is more enjoyable. You know, there's so many issues to remedy in our food supply from over a century of basically concentrating agriculture in California. Like there's just so many opportunities to do really cool. Th and people are doing those things. I see them. But sometimes, you know, the last thing people ever understand is how to raise capital. And I decided again in, in 2001, it's like, if a guy like me can understand capital, then we could really do something. And it's taken me a long, long time to get to this point where I'm so confident in my ability to guide people. And again, the big problem was who's going to pay for the bookkeeping, who's going to pay for the, keep their lights on while they're learning. Yeah. And, but if you think of the impact, what what's possible for the world, like instead of having entrepreneurship be this like heroic crisis thing every day, 
what if we give people who care about what you and I care about, the ABCs, the most the foundational uh, support, and let them make other mistakes? Like, I've made so many mistakes in my life. Why Why should people keep going down that path? It's just too hard. It's not, we're not really, it's, so I guess, to, again, to say again, like, having a thousand vegan restaurants, one-off, individually owned, like, really beautiful and enjoyable, that's such a valuable thing. We would want to pay people to be entrepreneurs. Mm. And that's really what I've designed is a way, I'm not just writing checks, but it's it's pretty easy to get enough money to pay your bills if you follow my instructions. Because these ideas are so popular. They're ridiculously popular. You just have to know how to ask and what to ask and how to take responsibility for other people's money. And that's pretty much what I teach. I mean, it's perfect. So I don't, I don't, I mean, I guess we'll have to figure out where to go from there with this whole thing. Um, did, how much more did you want to talk about? Well, if you have any questions, cause I've, you know, I've more or less gave a discourse. I mean, if, if you have any questions about leadership, finance, you know, how to, you know, so many people get like, they get so focused on the presidential elections, mm. but what, Grassroots leadership is so much more, so much more can be done with like more, le just more people understanding leadership. Like what is leadership? How do you build resonance with people around re resolving issues? And it's yeah. not like people can't see issues. They can see the garbage. Like in the city I'm in, it's really nice. It's not very polluted, but we have these diesel buses. Mm. And one day uh, on a different show, I watched some of the electric, you know, car channels, and this guy was talking about electric buses. It's like, wow, there's been a million electric buses sold already, and they're not that expensive. So I started having a few conversations. Literally within a few days, I had access to almost a whole leadership of this, no, wow. of this city of four million people, and I. Uh, I, I wasn't quite ready to just sort of lead the charge myself because I'm, I'm, I would much rather find somebody who wants to lead that project of replacing the the diesel buses with electric buses. It's just a fine, it's, I, I don't want to oversimplify it. Nothing is as easy as I think in general. Yeah. Like if I didn't think it was easy, I would never have gotten started. That's that's the entrepreneurial, uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurial mindset is like, it looks easy enough. You get some early feedback that's positive. It's like, okay, let's go for it. Pretty much all my business has started that way. Yeah. And then later you find out how hard it is. But so I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to um, understate how difficult this is. But we're really talking about raising about a million dollars to do a trial project of three buses and the charging infrastructure. And yeah, you got to work out: is there enough electricity? Is it in the right place? And who owns the buses and who makes these decisions? So that's a it's a classic leadership project because it takes a lot of talking before anything actually happens, before any commitment. You're you're trying to build commitment in a community. That's leadership is really that. You're trying to take your commitment and plant those seeds of commitment in more and more heads. And when finally that seed grows into kind of a a tree of commitment. Now you've got critical mass of commitment and things get done. And I have so many cool examples of how that works. There's so many different ways to to do that, but that's really what it is. The alternative, of course, is uh, get it done. That's another way to get commitment. It's like you show up, it's like, I'm committed that you do this and if you don't, I'll kill you. Yeah. So it's that's, that's the militarized approach to leadership. I don't do that. I don't give myself the right, even in words, to use uh, us versus them language. Yeah. Not that I don't always feel it, but I really, when I draw up the us, it's very common in in movements because we associate with the victims. In the animal rights movement, the victims are the animals. In the forest protection movement, I was in the trees were the victims. They can't talk for themselves. Mm -hmm. But be, there's something about movements is they attract People have a strong resonance with the real victims, and then we go out in the world, and and then we use that same victim logic, like we we want to blame everybody else, 
And so you get like a like a Greta Thunberg. And I think she did some valuable work early, but she's too old for that now. As a kid, why is this? When you're a kid, you have no power, except you have one power, mm. which is to make a fit and cause your parents to at least pay attention or try to stop the action. I don't know if you've ever tried to pick up a kid, but they have this way if they don't want to be out, they get like super heavy and you can't hold them. I don't know what it is, but they can just get squirmy and heavy. You can't hold them anymore. So, but that's it. You know, the kids can't manage your household budget. The kids are not managing the trillions of dollar budgets in the governments of the world. Mm -hmm. Those are the adults. So what we do is we use that victim mentality. Now, you know, we're adults, but instead of, looking what does it really mean what like you may hate what some of these people are doing but they're the ones that are the all of the hate is aimed at them so how is it that they're leading and we're only complaining so we're victim we're the child we're giving them this parental perspective but we're actually adults yeah and how do we how do we graduate but anyway so when you're in the environmental movement or the other movements it's really it's like it was a free pass to just blame everybody else. It's very therapeutic. It feels great to sit around and 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 name names and point fingers at everyone else. But around 2000, I, I discovered a whole different style of leadership. And it's like radical responsibility. It's like, well, what am I causing? What am I willing to be responsible for? And I saw, wow, like... Do, do what if I had my investment fund and you know billions of dollars in management and like that's people's life savings or their college funds or whatever and what if that goes to zero and I'm responsible for that it's like like I decide it's like you know I don't I thought maybe I don't know if you look because I was in politics president of the United States but if you want to be president of the United States you gotta be willing to kill people that's just part of the job it's like you don't want to do that don't yeah. run for president yeah you know, so I thought, well, could I really take on the responsibility of managing piles of money for other people? Now the things I'm doing really distribute the risk so widely that no one person, like more, what we need is more leaders who understand how to take responsibility, whether it's just for the little corner of their town or a hundred million dollars worth of electric buses or, you know, transforming a whole country or even the whole world. That's sort of a matter of taste, yeah. But the idea of commitment and responsibility, or be, you know, being the person who like I'm causing this, I'm not going to blame anybody else whether it succeeds or fails. That's a radical point of view about the world. But you can see the people who succeed the biggest; they all hold exactly what I'm saying. They're able to sustain commitments over time, and they rarely point the finger at anybody else, especially for their own failures. Mm. And that was a hard lesson because I was. It is a hard lesson. Being a victim, yeah. uh, being a victim was really. You know, that's like where I, where where I, people love that about me. When I stopped doing that, people thought, "Mark, what happened to you? Where's that angry guy that we used to like?" Yeah. <laughs> they thought I was on drugs. Like, how can you be happy? People were cutting down the Amazon. I said, "Well, look, me being unhappy doesn't help me work harder. It's not actually helping me solve any problems. So I just decided I'm not going to be unhappy." Yeah, I'm not saying I approve or I like it or I'm even going to stop fighting them. I'm just not going to be, let it ruin my day. Yeah. That was hard. That was hard to learn how to not let that stuff ruin my day. Yeah, it is a better mentality to have, though. Yeah, so, you know, McDougal, he's, he's good. These guys, they're great. He's a real leader. And I think, you know, I'd love to impart that kind of leadership. Now we've got there's more projects to do than people stepping up to do them and there's more money to fund it than ever and it's more easy to get than ever but the thing is the secret is finding a person who wants to wants to hold that commitment who wants to be that leader but if you've got that if you're if you're willing to hold the commitment i'll i'll help you see how to get all the resources without having to go through all the you know we're talking about over 40 years of trial and error because I had no mentors to speak of yeah. at all. I mean, I would I would get whatever I could from whoever I could, but no one understood. You know, what the environmental business, that's for charities. In the 80s, the idea of oh, yeah. business <laughs> yeah. for the yeah. environment, yeah. that people thought I was insane. I said, well, just watch, you know. And I saved my customers millions and millions of dollars. 
I knew there was an economic opportunity there to do the right thing. There's actually economic opportunities to help the whole world go vegan. It doesn't, we don't have to force them or make them eat bugs. Oh yeah, the bug thing too. I mean, they're pushing that. It's it, yeah. It's, that's really sick. Well, that's a whole. That's coming from very old mentality. Yeah. Very old war, domination, and of course we don't even need any more protein. No. We're over protein. We're pro over proteinated as it is. Oh I, yeah, <laughs> we are. These Everywhere. people are sick. These are some very very sick people who just happen to have a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, they don't have really. They're not really for human beings they're for themselves first yeah. you know we all got to take care of ourselves but really at a certain point it's like can you guys just like move on and let some people who really have some good ideas and i'm here for those people i want to help them somebody else then so you know yeah. everyone knows who i'm talking about so oh, yeah. i'm not gonna name i'm not gonna name any names but no. i think we all know who's sort of pushing this you know we got to get more protein to Africa, stuff like that. It's complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely Total. ridiculous. It's insane. It's really insane. And the, and it's like you say, well, how is it? How could they not know the truth at this point? Because the research, as Dr. McDill says, there's you know hundreds of a hundred years of research. There is. There really is. They I mean, how could they possibly think that promoting more protein is helping the planet? And but again, I think this is part of the problem. You know, when you get too narrowly focused, I'm still a vegan. I am still for vegans. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not, I don't like the kind of, I don't know the person tries to say, well, you're doing veganism wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, that's, you can, there was a really That's the first thing people say, is you're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't want to say that. I, in fact, one of my early models before I ever went vegan is like, there's no wrong way to ask people to save the planet. You know, we don't know the right way to do it because it's still, it's still, we're still living in, you know, hell world. So, yeah. so I don't know the right way, but I, I just know my way and I, my way actually does work. So I'm promoting that. I'm not saying some other ways won't work or aren't contributing, but, uh, so you could say, well, yeah, but you know, the meat industry has created this protein narrative. And if we don't kind of go along with it, we're just not going to get traction. So now I see like the other people on Instagram who I love their stuff. You know, they're usually cooks, but they're, they're cooking like this gorgeous vegan food. But they're always saying, oh, this one's high in protein and this one's high in protein. It's like, yeah, are you yeah. Even eating this stuff? You're skinny as hell. It's like, yeah. what, what, what are we, what are you talking about? And it's, it, it, it's unfortunate aesthetically. I, I'm very aesthetically minded person, so I still watch. But it's like there's no way a vegan of any sort should be around promoting. You can. I, I don't know. Again, what am I saying? That's a critique. Their theory is if we keep the meat industry protein myth going, then we'll somehow be able to kind of infiltrate. But what I just oh, demonstrated. Yeah. Yeah. What I just demonstrated earlier in this call, they're not going to do that. They're only getting into this stuff just to just as window dressing. They're not serious about it. If they were serious, if any one of these guys actually believed in what you and I understand, they would at least quit. You know, the CEO of Maple Leaf Foods would just say, guys, like, I'm sorry, I've gone vegan. I'm out of here. Yeah. You know, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And you know, I even question, like, the CEO of Whole Foods, who's always – wearing his veganism on his, on his shirt sleeve. And it's like, well, look, okay, I get you've got this whole thing. And if you cut out meat, you're, you're not going to, you know, people are going to go elsewhere and then you're going to lose all the other sales. But now Whole Foods will start in 1980. You know, this guy's been vegan a long time. How about use some of your resources and your network to start pure vegan grocery stores? Why aren't you a leader in that? Why don't you quit Whole Foods, give it to somebody else and, and start the next wave? But, you know, it's a lot to ask, but I just, it really, it's always made, I just don't think a real vegan is going to sell meat for any excuse hmm. and come what may. And I, I don't really believe in this ends justify the means kind, kind of uh, thinking. I don't, that's how every kind of war in the whole world has ever been started is by thinking, well, we're going to sell meat because that's the only way we're going to be able to get our vegan message or our plant-based message. And 
you know, now Whole Foods, I don't even know his name, but it's like, it's like, you know, key, it's like, I call it the keto corner. I mean, they've just gone crazy. Anything that, anything that any influencer says is healthy, they're going to have an end cap in Whole Foods now Yeah, for that. It's like, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's too bad. Like, how about we just sell food and nothing else? <laughs> there but anyway, I'm out there. Yeah. But th- you can see there's opportunities now. The vegan movement has grown. The idea, Dr. McDougal has been successful. Yeah, you got to take the that model and, and send it to other people. Yeah, look at you. You had 10,000 people on your Dr. McDougal video. When I first met you, you were just like getting, I don't know, 20 views or something like that. Yeah. So we know. Yeah, that was a while ago. Now we're in the right place. Yeah. Yeah, so the next phase of growth, in my opinion, is more leadership, mobilizing the money that's already there, who want what you and I want, put it into projects that make a difference, and let's just keep going. Another thing that I would like to talk about is, uh, not right now, but in the next video, is teaching people how to garden again, because I I feel like if people were uh, Mm -hmm. doing that, I think that would help a lot as well, and it it's like a family activity as well, so you can kind of get the the family involved. I think that's a, another market. Well, I, mean, really needs- I mean, I'm gardening. We that? can talk. For me, what's for mo- the most part, you know, we're entering this sort of weird phase of scarcity in the U.S. There's been so much inflation; a lot of people are suffering now, and this means we're going to, you know, an economic transition is happening. What kind? And how we're going to help people continue to advance their health and their economic freedom in the light of this sort of weird, um, you know, this the economic shenanigans that have been going on at the high level with the value of the dollar and other things like that. And and again, a lot of times this is sort of like a constant anyway. But when things are having trouble at the at the high level. This is when things at the grassroots level can really work. And when I've traveled, you know, people say, well, the people in Cambodia are only living on a dollar or two a day. Well, you know, I visit some of these villages is this because they're not a financialized economy. They're very communitarian. They get their resources and their needs met com- communally much more so than monetarily. In the U.S., basically, if you want to have a friend, you pretty much have to pay, like, you know, you're going to go see a therapist. You need somebody to talk to about your problems. That's a hundred bucks an hour, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I said, so we don't really have, or like a friend of mine there uh, was, uh, he explained like, uh, you want to build a roof. Like you want to build a house. The community comes together. They build the house. They put the roof on. Where in the United States are you going to, maybe except the Amish people are still doing that. But aside from that kind of thing, you need a roof, takes bucks, takes cash. So a combination of using mo- the money that we have much more, like money is, there's a there's a kind of a beautiful aspect of money because it, it um, it's, a, it's a token. It's like a little mini contract in words and it talks about the words that we use to describe our commitments. And commitment is a very personal, internal human thing. It's not really monetizable per se. Uh, you know, here in Mexico, there were whole civilizations built without money. They were non-monetized. They still built pyramids and all kinds of crazy stuff. So we're, money's become this sort of surrogate between human beings, being able to make and hold and execute commitments with each other. It's a really beautiful aspect. It kills creativity. Well, let's just say it's an inner. It's it's getting somebody else's finger in between our really deep communication but it also facilitates some very amazing results mm. and now it's our turn to make a new vision and then a hundred years from now people are going god i wish that you know we don't know what mistakes we're going to make but i think we can see that we can certainly improve on the past mm. so again i would say this could be a whole discussion if we really look at money carefully there's really nothing to it that would get in the way of creativity. It's much, it's some, because in the end, it's very human phenomenon. I mean, we're human to human. To the extent that money's a problem, we let it be, as opposed to, yeah, they're trying to do whatever they're doing, the, the mucky bucks at, at the banks and whatever. You know, it might rain one day, it might be sunny one day. I don't worry about what those guys are doing. I just look, okay, here's what's happening. 
the rain's coming in, I'm going to get an umbrella. I'm not going to yell at the rain or think the rain, you know what I'm saying? So, and I, I'm not trying to really attack you. I'm just saying that really, it's just a matter of choice how much money we want to, how much we want to monetize our culture. Hmm. But I'm not saying it's hard to get off because once you're used to this whole, like this whole system, we're like rats in a maze. There's so many aspects of this system that have been designed to take away our freedom. So what we're really doing, when we talk about food, you, you know, that's why you and I are here, what we put in our mouths, that's a real declaration of freedom. When we're eating rice and beans instead of a steak, that creates so much freedom, freedom from the medical system, freedom from, you know, it's so much cheaper financially in our mm -hmm. health. It's just, so when we look at the money system and our interaction with it, where's the maximum freedom? Can we go all the way back to civilization with no money? I think that'd be pretty hard for most Americans, especially ones who don't have any money. It's usually the ones yeah. that the most they want to somehow tell everyone else to live without money. So I'm a, I'm I'm not a I'm more integrative in terms of how. But all I'm saying is that my travels around the world, I've observed that there's the people who are living more in community, and community is a much more of an inner communication. Point and a point of view about life. The people who live better in community just seem a lot happier. The ones who get more of the resources from community instead of from money, they look happier than me. Yeah, you know. I mean, it, I mean, it it kind of I, it kind of happened too when people started living leaving the cities. I think there was a lot more of that when people were all centrally located in in the cities, and there was a lot more community. That now everybody's so widespread you don't see it as much and a lot more well, right. suburbanization, uh, and, yes suburbanization and the the car culture yeah, really and, done and, and the commute and the commuting and, and everything that you know think about how many hours of your day you know gets absorbed with that so i think a lot of that um has yeah kind of i've never lived that way community. the farthest i ever lived away from the job was like a 10 minute bike ride yeah i i've done it i i did it when i lived in philly and i, I would never do that again the, it's yeah. so it's so destructive to our just the experience of being alive you know yeah. like i think i like you you what, what was it arthur you mentioned that the art on one of your videos how you you know i've watched a lot of arthur's videos he's a happy guy you know arnold that's really the first. arnold right arnold arnold, arnold. Yeah. Arnold's, arnold yeah it's like that's really the goal the first goal is can we be happy that's not necessarily as hard as it looks. And then from there, how do we create more and more and share that with other people? And we're in a system that was born out of a lot of really, a lot of unhappiness and a lot of mis you know, a lot of misguided energy. War is completely stupid. Anything that comes from that paradigm is going to be a disaster. Yeah. And, but we're, our, our bodies aren't evolving so much, but certainly our consciousness is and the ability. Human beings have more capacity to change their behavior than any other animal on the planet. You know, the squirrels never learn. They always run out in front of the cars in the street. Yeah. They don't see it. It's like, how come they never say, hey, look what happened to him. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Because they're, 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 the majority of their behavior is instinctive. The majority of our behavior is learned. And the, when you understand how that happens in the whole process by which we acquire our entire life habitry, the habits of how we think and how we react, these things are all built one brick at a time. And when you see that, you can you can tinker around. So society can really change. People can change dramatically. It's only, It can be a little freaky for the better, but it's constantly yeah, a little and that freaky. happens fast. Yeah. So we that, but at the same time, that means that the future is not cast in stone. Whatever we want to create, if we want to do it, there's a, a possibility for that to happen. And any, do you want me to put all your stuff down in the description section? Do you want to talk about that real quick? Where 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 people? Oh, yeah. Can all, you know, my website's markwinstein.com, and I have my first course up. It's called How to Achieve Impossible Goals. But I also have a, a, a page that says work with me. Um, it's not a high ticket program necessarily. Just the, the thing is, if you have a project you want to get done, fill in that form. If you want to work with me personally, 
and I'll look, and if there's some way I can help you, most people I'm working with now, I'm not charging them yet because they're not they're not generating enough revenue. And again, I'll I'm gonna oh, sorry about that. More fireworks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you have a project you want to succeed at, you can um, you can let me know in that form, and we'll start a little discussion about how I might be able to help you. And I usually, these days, I usually only get paid when you get paid. Mm. So, and I've got a, my whole course, the How to Achieve Impossible Goals is also my YouTube channel, which is at Mark Winstein, YouTube slash at Mark Winstein. Mm. And uh, so you can watch my whole course, just you're not going to get my personal engagement in that course. If you go and buy it online, it's twenty nine ninety five, and you get me uh, tech support, as well as a nice workbook I put together for the course. But learning how to achieve impossible goals, it's a great, it's a great skill. Like that will change your life because most of us really don't achieve things because mainly we just don't even believe we can. Yeah. And this, this will crack that wide open. You'll realize that what you, you know, help you decide what you really want to do. And I have another course that'll be, that I'm putting together that'll even in, enhance that. So, yeah, I gotta say one last thing. My dad always said, "Follow your dreams," but he didn't tell me how. Mm -hmm. So I follow my dreams. Now I have a methodology, and it's not like you know a lot of people on YouTube are just like, "Well, how to make a ten thousand dollars a month?" You know, follow my template. I'm looking for visionaries, people who want to whether again they want to build a restaurant or something small or something huge, but they they've got a picture in their mind. They want to build something in the three dimensional world something maybe a little harder to do than just be a pure communicator. Like they want to really, they want to build a transactional business, especially when you, again, when you look at, when you look at a guy like Elon Musk, whether you like him or not, he's moved a lot of heavy material. You know, he's really, he's really an entrepreneur in the 3D world. And our problems are three dimensional, you know, the food supply, our bodies, these are all, you know, IRL, they're in real life. So I'm yeah. I'm most interested in that kind of entrepreneur that wants to really get in and, and change the way the the 3D world looks and operates. So uh yeah, markwinstein.com and Mark Winstein is my YouTube channel, and that's pretty much my main communication these days. I've got a I've got an Instagram channel I look at every once in a while, but I'm not I'm not big there. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, but anyway, thank you. To close this out, uh, put all your comments and questions down in the comment section where, like always, uh, we'll go over all that in another video and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks again for coming on here. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. I see you. Bye.